reading from the Gospel according to Luke. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we will wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the en enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to you, God. Amen. Well, there's two reasons I can tell you're Methodist. You sing in parts, and you're all sitting in the back. <laughs> that makes a Methodist, I guess. Anyone ever hear of Mike Warnke? One person. Well, he's a, an evangelist who spends most of his time in Kentucky and Tennessee, um, but he uses a lot of humor in what he, he gets his message across with humor. And he was telling one story that I don't think he really had to add much humor to it at all, uh, other than the way he told it. But he said he was driving through Tennessee going to one of his evangelism revival things, and he noticed he was getting low on gas. As he approached Martin, Tennessee, he pulled off in a gas station at the edge of town. And this is back in the 80s, so when he finished pumping, he had to go into the store to, to pay. And when he finished, he came out, and he saw these three guys standing over by the pop machines, and they were talking about religion. And, it looked like two of them were kind of poking fun at the third about not having as much faith as they did. And he asked them, well, what church you guys go to? He said, we're Pentecostal. We're ones that handle snakes. Okay, and what about you? And he said, I'm Methodist. We don't handle snakes. He said, okay, well, I'm not going to get involved in your argument. So he got in his car, drove off, did his thing. A year later, he's driving the same road, going to a different destination, but he goes through Martin, he needs gas, so he pulls into the same gas station. There, after he pumps his gas, pays for it, comes out, and he notices two guys standing over by the pop machines wearing suits. That's two of the three that were there the year before. And he said, Weren't there three of you last year? How, well, how come you guys are dressed in suits? And he said, well, we're on our way to Bubba's funeral. And he said, what happened? I said, Bubba got uh, at our worship service over at the Pentecostal church. He got bit by a snake. And Mike scratched his head and said, you're Pentecostal still, right? He said, no, I'm Methodist now. It always helps to know that if you're going to pick and choose something out of the Bible that you want to do, make sure it's God that's telling you to do it. 
because if God doesn't necessarily want you to be handling snakes, you probably better not be handling snakes. So we got to listen for God's voice first as to what God wants us to do. And for the 72 that he sent out, he said, I'm giving you all the power over the enemy, and you can put your hand over the adder's den and they won't harm you. I'm giving you that power. And they came back with stories. Even demons obeyed us in your name. As if they went with any doubts. Think about that one for a while. They were supposed to go and tell them the kingdom of God is near. Cast out demons, heal the sick. And they went as if they didn't quite believe it. But they went with the power of God in them anyway. And they come back with these stories. Even demons left and obeyed us in your name. And so Jesus has to uh, bring them down a notch. Because we don't want to ever think that we're going to get to heaven because we do miracles. We want to praise God with exceeding praise because our names are written up there. Not because God's allowed us the privilege and given us the power to do miracles. That's just a byproduct of our obedience, right? We're supposed to be obedient to what God tells us to do. But what Jesus is telling people is, I am giving you power, and I want you to go and do. We've got to go back into the world. But we're supposed to do things for God that God tells us to do. So we have to first open the ears so God will tell us what we need to know to do. And then we need to have the courage to go and do it. Because chances are you'll be out of your comfort zone. And I always like to do something funny with congregations. Like, I'm going to get out of my comfort zone up there and come preach to y'all. You know what God wants you to be doing? You're supposed to be doing it. Right? I'll come over here and do the same thing. Do you know what God wants for you to do? And don't tell me you're too old and my body don't do this anymore. You have a phone. Anybody can call the neighbors. Listen for what God's telling you to do because God wants you to be doing stuff. I walk to the back sometimes and then the people in the front have the bad seats, right? We're supposed to be doing that. Now, what Paul's doing, he has just been stoned. He lived through it. So you can imagine what your body would look like if people threw rocks at it. He had bruises everywhere. But he praised God. He said, these are the marks of Jesus on me. Don't hurt me because I already bear these bruises. And he says, The only thing that keeps us going is following that. Keep your focus on the cross. No matter what you're doing, your goal in front of you is the cross of Jesus. Remember, reminding us he died for us. I see some Christians that walk around thinking, well, we don't need the doctrine of atonement anymore because it's all about love. All we've got to do is love people. And No. We need to follow the cross. We need to be in the shadow of the cross all the time. We can never get away from the cross of Jesus and the suffering and death that he did for us. It's an insult to him to say we don't need it anymore. It's an insult to Jesus if we go through life not being humble before him at all times. 
Now remember what I read in Isaiah. Israel is still in captivity. Jerusalem and Israel has been destroyed. And there he's, Isaiah saying, Jerusalem's going to have all these people coming to it, and you're going to get your strength from Jerusalem? And the Jews are probably saying, yeah, it is no more. Where, what have you been smoking, pal? But Isaiah's telling them, it's going to happen. And he, I don't know if you know much about the language of Israel. Hebrew language is interesting. There's two tenses of verbs in, in Hebrew. Either the action is finished or the action is not finished, which means it's still in the future. So when Jerusalem being in the future is being talked about by Isaiah, he's using the past tense because he believed God with that kind of faith. Do you believe God with that kind of faith? God will lift up the remnant, right? We see the great falling away of Christians out of churches everywhere, all around the world. I never thought I'd see it in America, but it's happening here too. And God will raise up the remnant to be the ones to tell the world about Jesus Christ, and we need to be the ones willing to go. And Jesus said, go! Go two by two, by the way. Always go two by two. One is protection for individuals, and two is the number of witnesses. In our culture, two people at different times separate from each other, needed to say the exact same thing about a crime to convict anybody in their court of law. Two is the number of witnesses, so he sent 36 groups of two out there, and they went out. Can you see yourself as a group of two with somebody and go around Jeffersonville and talk to a our community about Jesus Christ. We're not stealing from other churches. I want that known right off the bat. If they go to church somewhere else or belong somewhere else but don't go, encourage them to get back to their church right away. But we need to reach the folks that don't know about Jesus. There's two generations now that have been out of church. Or three generations ago, they were in church. Sadly to say, I think my generation is the one that started leaving the church in faster than any others. And they've been raising kids and now grandkids out of the church. We got to go back and teach them. Teach them about the love of Christ, that he died on a cross to take away all our sins. All those times we turned away from God and did my thing. I want to do it my way. I think in the 70s, Frank Sinatra sang the song, My Way. Isn't that indicative of the where the country's gone? The wrong way. Is now they got the country thinking Republican way and Democrat way. I still go Jesus' way which sometimes is Democrat, sometimes is Republican. I, I know some of you are each party there. I'll tell you now, I'm staunch independent. I'm neither party on purpose. Because I know if I talk about one party, the other people get to, oh, he's one of them. So we got to think Jesus' way. Whichever party we may be walking along at the time, Sometimes we're with one, sometimes we may be with the other. But what our country needs is someone to bring us together. And there's only one person who can do it, and he died on a cross. And it's up to us to tell the world. Because they're not going to hear about it. They're saying you, shan't, you can't say Jesus in the workplace. You can't say Jesus on the internet. Well, they try to tell people, but it doesn't work. And if you're in a workplace and that's the rule, 
just get someone to ask you a question about it, and then you can talk about it. Now, there's things we can do to trick around the rules. The rules are anti-Christ. We need to get around them. In that case, I will get us to think about one thing. With all the scriptures, all the hymns we've sung, victory in Jesus and how great thou art and all that stuff, keep our focus on Christ. Every moment of every day, all year long. Stay humble before the cross of Christ and allow him to speak to you. Listen to what he says and then go do you say English isn't a diff difficult language. Of course it's difficult. G-O is pronounced go. D-O is not pronounced do. It's do. And this is the stuff we're trying to teach kindergartners. But go and do. So while we're here, we're hopefully listening for our marching one. Always remembering, we follow the cross. Amen? Let's pray. Most holy God, we thank you for this time together. Accept our worship as we humble our souls before you. Speak to us as to what we can do tomorrow and the rest of the week. Help us to let this community know about Jesus and that you can be found at this church. You can be found at other churches too. Help us to be the ones to tell the world of the wonders in Christ. These things we lift in his holy name. Amen. Go forth into the world. Go. Do. Whatever Jesus tells you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, blessings be yours this week. Amen.